Hello, I'm going to tell you a little bit about transnational advocacy networks. I'm using just one source here, a book by Margaret Keck and Catherine Sickink from 1998 called Activists Beyond Borders. This is a really good book. They use three cases to study transnational advocacy networks, human rights, the environment, and violence against women. They define transnational advocacy networks as those relevant actors working internationally on an issue who are bound together by shared values, a common discourse, and dense exchanges of information and services. Networks are forms of organizations characterized by voluntary, reciprocal, and horizontal patterns of communication and exchange. Keck and Sikink identify three scenarios in which transnational advocacy networks are most commonly used, but I'll be focusing just on this top one, when channels between domestic groups and their government are blocked or hampered, or where such channels are ineffective for resolving a conflict. So basically, activists within a country are trying to get their own government to do something, and their government's not listening, and that's when it's time to work internationally to see if you could get it done that way. I love this quote. I'm going to read it first, and then I'll talk about it a bit. At the core of the relationship is information exchange. What is novel in these networks is the ability of non-traditional international actors to mobilize information strategically to help create new issues and categories and to persuade pressure and gain leverage over much more powerful organizations and governments. Activist networks try not only to influence policy outcomes, but to transform the terms and nature of the debate. Their goal is to change the behavior of states and of international organizations. So activists are affecting the behavior of governments and international organizations, and they're doing it with just information. That's pretty cool. This is how they use the information. The information needs to be reliable, well-documented, timely, and dramatic, and they often combine testimony and technical and statistical information. The testimony can put a human face on the issue, but then the statistical information can make it clear that this isn't just something anecdotally happening to a few people. This is really affecting many people in a big way. And then they have to frame their information, um, often simply just in terms of right and wrong, but they do this to make, the, make it comprehensible to target audiences, to attract attention and encourage action, and to fit with favorable institutional venues. Um, Heads up, the next three slides aren't pretty. They are about human trafficking, slavery, and murder. So this is an example I thought I would use for this coming from Thailand. Within their seafood industry, there's human trafficking, slavery, and murder. Um, the next two slides are from this same website here. Um, first, you have all the statistics, just kind of telling you what a big issue this is. At the very bottom, you can see they say 59% of trafficked migrants interviewed aboard Thai fishing vessels reported witnessing the murder of a fellow worker. So this is a very easy thing to translate cross-culturally. You don't need to know anything about Thai culture or Thailand, the country, to get that murder is bad. Um, and it's obviously very dramatic as well. And then they have the testimony this is a quote by an escaped victim of trafficking who says, I witnessed murder with my own eyes. One of Keck and Sekink's main contributions is the idea of the boomerang pattern. And just for an example, I'm going to put in the names of Thailand and the U.S., but it could be any countries. And just to be totally fair to Thailand, I don't actually know what the Thai government is doing about this problem and maybe they're already trying to take care of it. I also don't know what the U.S. is doing, whether or not they're trying to help. So these are just an example. Let's say in this case, Thai activists are trying to reach the Thai government. If the Thai government is not being responsive, what the Thai activists can do is look globally for their allies. Let's say they have some partners in the U.S. The American activists can put pressure on the U.S. government, and then the U.S. government can pressure Thailand. That was my cat. Um, here's a picture of the same idea. You can see over on the state A column on the left, the NGOs can't get through to their own government. 
they send information to NGOs in state B. Those NGOs influence state B, who put pressure on state A. Keck and Sicking divide their tactics into four categories. Um, number one, information politics, the ability to quickly and credibly generate politically usable information and move it to where it will have the most impact. Number two, symbolic politics, the ability to call upon symbols, actions, or stories that make sense of a situation for an audience that is frequently far away. Leverage politics, the ability to call upon powerful actors to affect a situation where weaker members of a network are unlikely to have influence. So if the Thai government wasn't listening to people in their own country, um, the U.S. government probably could exert some pressure on them using something as leverage, whether it's a vote in the UN or a treaty or a trade deal or anything like that. And then last, accountability politics, which is the effort to hold powerful actors to their previously stated policies or principles. So if you can get a country to sign an international treaty saying they oppose human trafficking and they're going to do everything they can to stop it, um, then you would be able to be like, hey, you said you would do this and you're not doing it. That's not necessarily going to make them do it, but naming and shaming them like that could have some impact. Keck and Sikink also break this down into stages of influence. I'm not going to go through all of these, but I just want to point out that they go from issue creation and agenda setting to influence on state behavior. So the first one is just saying this thing is a problem. One of the examples they give in the book is violence against women. Once upon a time, nobody talked about violence against women. They might talk about individual things happening. They might say rape is bad or, you know, beating your wife is bad or, you know, what have you, different types of violence against women. But it was a really big thing when a bunch of women got together and they realized we all have this common problem and we have this shared way we can talk about it globally. And then that really became a global issue that now it's on the table. That's an issue that we talk about now and it wasn't before. And then all the way down to influence on state behavior. So when you get people to talk about something as an issue, that doesn't mean the issue changes or gets solved in any way. Um, but that's what they're working toward. That's that last stage where the government is like, okay, we're going to do something, and they do it. Um, this was the other thing that I found really important from Keck and Sicking's study. They found two cases when transnational advocacy networks are the most effective. Number one, issues involving bodily harm to vulnerable individuals, especially when there is a short and clear causal chain or story assigning responsibility. So the example we just saw from Thailand is very obviously an issue of that. You have vulnerable individuals, bodily harm, and a very obvious, you know, who's to blame. Clearly the people doing the enslaving and the murder are the problem. And then also issues involving legal equality of opportunity are the other types of issues that really um, are most effective here. So that's everything I have on this topic, and I hope you enjoyed it.